Our call to worship is from Psalm 95. O come, let us sing unto the Lord. Let us make a joyful noise to the rock of our salvation. Let us come before his presence with thanksgiving and make a joyful noise unto him with psalms. Let's ask God's blessing on our worship and silent prayer. Our help is in the name of Jehovah, who made heaven and earth, beloved in our Lord Jesus Christ. Grace, mercy, and peace be granted unto you from God our Father, through Jesus Christ our Lord, by the operation of the Holy Spirit. Amen. We sing from Psalter 163. This is an expression of our love for God, our desire to be near to him. And let's sing the three stanzas of 163.
We worship God by hearing his law. God spake all these words, saying, I am the Lord thy God, which have brought thee out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of bondage. First, thou shalt have no other gods before me. Second, thou shalt not make unto thee any graven image or any likeness of anything that is in heaven above or that is in the earth beneath or that is in the water under the earth. Thou shalt not bow down thyself to them nor serve them. For I, the Lord thy God, am a jealous God, visiting the iniquity of the fathers upon the children unto the third and fourth generation of them that hate me, and showing mercy unto thousands of them that love me and keep my commandments. Third, thou shalt not take the name of the Lord thy God in vain, for the Lord will not hold him guiltless that taketh his name in vain. Fourth, remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Six days shalt thou labor and do all thy work, but the seventh day is the Sabbath of the Lord thy God. In it thou shalt not do any work, thou nor thy son, nor thy daughter, thy manservant, nor thy maidservant, nor thy cattle, nor thy stranger that is within thy gates. For in six days the Lord made heaven and earth, the sea and all that in them is, and rested the seventh day. Wherefore, the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and hallowed it. Fifth, honor thy father and thy mother, that thy days may be long upon the land which the Lord thy God giveth thee. Sixth, thou shalt not kill Seventh, thou shalt not commit adultery. Eighth, thou shalt not steal. Ninth, thou shalt not bear false witness against thy neighbor. Tenth, thou shalt not covet or desire thy neighbor's house. Thou shalt not covet thy neighbor's wife, nor his manservant, nor his maidservant, nor his ox, nor his ass, nor anything that is thy neighbor's. The Lord Jesus summarized this law for us in Matthew 22. Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart and with all thy soul and with all thy mind. This is the first and great commandment and the second is like unto it, thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. On these two commandments hang all the law and the prophets. We sing from Psalter 171. We sing of God's mighty works. And let's sing the three stanzas of 171. Yeah. 
Let us worship God together in prayer. Our Father in heaven, as we come into thy presence at the beginning of another Sabbath day, we express to thee our love. We love thee. We love thee as children love their father. We love thee as those who are saved and redeemed love their Savior and Redeemer. We love thee, O Father, because thou hast first loved us. There was no love in our hearts for thee, and there is no love in our hearts for thee by nature, but thou hast poured out thy love into our hearts, so that we know ourselves to be loved by thee, and so that we return to thee love. We delight in thee, the God of our salvation. We adore thee, the God who is exalted above all, the creator of the heavens and the earth. We praise and magnify thy most holy and righteous name, and everything that is within us is stirred up, O Father, to bless thy name, for thou art God and thou art good and yet we also confess, O Father, that we are by nature prone to hate thee and to hate our neighbor. And this, O Father, is a great grief to us. That we would have within us a nature, the old man, the flesh, which hates thee, and which is at enmity against thee. This is a horrifying reality with which we must live each day. Because we love thee, and yet we find within ourselves those stirrings of hatred and animosity and enmity against thee. We find within ourselves resentment against thee, even sometimes as we come to public worship, we find that rebellion within our hearts where we say to ourselves, we don't want to be here, we want to be somewhere else, we want to fulfill our lusts and our pleasures instead of being in the house of our God. O oh, Father, forgive us for such thoughts 
forgive us for such wicked attitudes against the God who has loved us. And we pray, O Father, give us thy Holy Spirit in rich, abundant measure, so that we, by the power of thy Holy Spirit, can crucify the flesh which is within us, so that we have true sorrow over those things, those stirrings up of hatred against thee, so that we we hate those things and we flee from those things as much as we can. And we pray, O Father, also that those inclinations of the flesh might not bear fruit in us so that they become more than mere inclinations, but they become words, words which we speak against thee, and words which we speak against thy truth and against thy church and against thy son. Horrible words, O Father. And grant, O Father, that those evil inclinations do not bear fruit in deeds either, so that we do things which express hatred and enmity against thee, our God. We thank thee, O Father, that thou didst promise in the beginning to put enmity between two seeds, so that although our first parents, Adam and Eve, had become friends with the devil, thou didst place enmity between them to destroy that alliance, that friendship that they had established. And instead, thou didst restore that beautiful relationship of covenant fellowship and friendship that thou didst establish with Adam and Eve and thyself. We thank thee, O Father, for that enmity. Not enmity against thee, but enmity against the devil and enmity against sin so that we do indeed from the heart, we do indeed sorrow over sin, and we do indeed hate that sin. Strengthen, O Father, that kind of enmity within us, enmity against sin, and weaken within us the enmity that our flesh has against thee, and give us the grace to live out of the new man, the new man which is created in knowledge and in righteousness and in holiness within us so that we have been transformed and are no longer dead in our trespasses and sins. We pray, O Father, give us grace to love thee and to love our neighbor as well. Thou hast placed many neighbors in our lives, chiefly in our homes, but also in other relationships as well. And we pray, O Father, give us grace to love that neighbor whom thou hast placed in our life along our pathway, so that when we see him or her, we seek to do good to our neighbor and not to do evil to him or her. We seek his or her welfare above our own because we love ourselves. It is easy for us to love ourselves. It is easy for us to be self-centered and selfish and to seek our own things but more difficult it is for us to love others and to seek their good and to seek to serve them. And we thank thee, O Father, for thy Son, Jesus Christ, who did not serve himself. He is the King of glory, but he did not serve himself, but he became a servant for us. He humbled himself and became a servant 
And he came not to be ministered unto, but to minister and to give his life a ransom for many. We thank thee, O Father, for him, for his blood that was shed on the cross for our salvation. And we pray, O Father, as we remember him, remember who he is and remember what he has done for us, we might be filled with delight. We might love him and delight in him and seek above all things to please him and therefore to please thee, the God who sent him. We thank thee for all the gifts that thou hast given to us in this life. Thou hast given to us food and drink and clothing and shelter. Thou hast given to us families and friends and a congregation of thy people where we have a name and a place. Thou hast given to us fellow believers who encourage us along the pathway that leads to heaven and even who keep us accountable, who watch for our souls. Thou hast given to us office bearers to rule in the congregation who especially are called to watch for our souls, to shepherd us. Thou hast given to us a pastor. Thou hast given to us the regular preaching of the gospel. Thou hast given also unto us schools where we can instruct or have our children instructed in the fear of thy name. We thank thee that thou hast put into the hearts of our children and young people love for thee, so that they sing thy praises from the heart, and so that they seek to serve thee in the way in which they live in their day-to-day -day lives. And we know, O oh Father, that they are surrounded by many temptations as we are preserved. O oh, we beseech thee, preserve them in these evil days, that the generation coming after us might not be a generation that knows not the Lord or the wonderful works which he has performed, but rather a generation that knows the Lord and does exploits and mighty deeds of righteousness before thy face to the glory of thy name. Bless those with particular trials and afflictions, whether sickness or disappointment or loss. Be near unto them, comfort and strengthen them. And bless us, O Father, and prepare our hearts to hear thy word. Give us grace to believe, to lay hold upon that word and to live according to it so that in this way we might bring glory and honor unto thee, the most holy God. All this we pray, for Christ's sake alone. Amen. We worship God with our offerings for the General Fund and the Benevolence Fund.
We sing from Psalter 341, the four stanzas of 341. We read God's word this morning in the gospel according to Mark, Mark chapter 12. Mark chapter 12, beginning at verse 28. And one of the scribes came, and having heard them reasoning together, and perceiving that he had answered them well, asked him, Which is the first commandment of all? And Jesus answered him, The first of all the commandments is, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one Lord, and thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, and with all thy soul, and with all thy mind, and with all thy strength. This is the first commandment. And the second is like, namely this, thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. There is none other commandment greater than these. And the scribe said unto him, Well, master, thou hast said the truth. For there is one God, and there is none other but he. And to love him with all the heart, and with all the understanding, and with all the soul, and with all the strength, and to love his neighbor as himself, is more than all whole burnt offerings and sacrifices. And when Jesus saw that he answered discreetly, he said unto him, Thou art not far from the kingdom of God. And no man after that durst ask him any question. And Jesus answered and said, while he taught in the temple, How say the scribes that Christ is the son of David? For David himself said by the Holy Ghost, The Lord said to my Lord, Sit thou on my right hand, till I make thine enemies thy footstool. That's Psalm 110. David therefore himself calleth him Lord, and whence is he then his son? And the common people heard him gladly. 
And he said unto them in his doctrine, Beware of the scribes which love to go in long clothing and love salutations in the marketplaces and the chief seats in the synagogues and the uppermost rooms at feasts which devour widows' houses and for a pretense make long prayers. These shall receive greater damnation. And Jesus sat over against the treasury and beheld how the people cast money into the treasury, and many that were rich cast in much. And there came a certain poor widow, and she threw in two mites, which make a farthing. And he called unto him his disciples, and saith unto them, Verily I say unto you, that this poor widow hath cast more in than all they which have cast into the treasury. For all they did cast in of their abundance, but she of her want did cast in all that she had, even all her living. Thus far we read God's holy word. We turn in the Heidelberg Catechism, page 3 at the back of the Psalter, to Lord's Day 2, Lord's Day 2. Whence knowest thou thy misery? Out of the law of God. What doth the law of God require of us? Christ teaches us that briefly in Matthew 22, 37 through 40, thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, with all thy soul, and with all thy mind, and with all thy strength. This is the first and the great commandment, and the second is like unto it, thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. On these two commandments hang all the law and the prophets. Canst thou keep all these things perfectly? In no wise, for I am prone by nature to hate God and my neighbor. Beloved, last week we saw the introduction and the theme of the Heidelberg Catechism, comfort, and we learned that comfort is a great good which strengthens, upholds, supports, and cheers us in the midst of misery. We learned that this comfort is comfort for all Christians in all circumstances of their lives. And this comfort, the Catechism identifies as this, we belong to our faithful Savior, Jesus Christ. And now the Catechism, to teach us more about our comfort, brings us to a consideration of our misery. Because remember that comfort operates in the midst of misery. Comfort does not remove the misery, but comfort strengthens, upholds, supports, and cheers us in the midst of our misery. And that brings us then to Lord's Day 2. What is this misery, and how do we know this misery? And the answer is we know it from God's law. Notice then the law revealing our misery. The law revealing our misery. Notice first what our misery is, then what the law requires, and finally what the law reveals. Lord's Day 2 begins this way, whence knowest thou thy misery? And that word whence means from where, from where. We're looking here then at the source of something. The question is not, though, 
whence is thy misery, or what is the source of thy misery? But the question is, whence knowest thou thy misery? How do you know that you are miserable? What is the source of that knowledge? Nor is the question this, art thou miserable, or are you miserable? The catechism presupposes that we are miserable. The catechism has told us already in Lord's Day 1 that we are miserable. The question is, how do you know that you are miserable? Where is the source of that knowledge? And the catechism establishes our misery right at the beginning. It did so in Lord's Day 1. How many things are necessary for thee to know that thy enjoying this comfort, the comfort of belonging to Jesus Christ, mayest live and die happily? And the answer was given to us already how great my sins and miseries are. That's the first thing I must know if I am going to enjoy this comfort. And notice also the word are. It's not how great my sins and miseries were in the past, but how great my sins and miseries are in the present. It's not were you miserable in the past and no longer miserable today, but rather you are miserable in the present, but what comforts you in the midst of that present reality? If I asked you this morning, are you miserable? The answer is yes. The answer ought to be if you are a Christian, yes, I am miserable. What is misery, though? Well, misery is a state of great distress of the mind or the body. Misery is the opposite, then, of joy or happiness, of peace and delight. And misery is more than what we feel because we don't always feel miserable, but misery is what we are. We are miserable because we are sinners. And again, if I ask that question, what is your misery? You might get many different answers in the world. If I ask that question of you, congregation, what is your misery? I might get different answers from you, but the correct answer is my sin. My misery is my sin. How great my sins and miseries are. Now, of course, that answer is not very popular in the world or even in the church world. Many will not acknowledge that to be their misery. They will say, well, the judgments of God upon sin in this life, they are misery. Sickness is misery, or poverty is misery, or loss is misery. But those things are not the actual misery, of course. Those things are, you might say, symptoms of the misery. We have those things. We experience those things in this life because we live in a world which is under the power of sin and under the judgment of God. We live in a world with bodies and minds affected by sin so that all of these Symptoms of misery are really inevitable in our lives. We're going to be sick. We're going to lose things. And eventually, we're going to die if Christ does not come 
before our death. In fact, many people would say to themselves, I could be very happy in this life if there were no judgments of God upon sin. Because sin isn't really my misery, you understand. Sin is is something I want to do, says the unbeliever in the world. I want to sin, but I don't like the consequences of sin. I don't like the judgments of God upon sin. Those things are my misery. Because sin, of course, has a certain attraction to it, which for the wicked is irresistible. Sin is pleasurable. Sin appeals to the flesh. Sin fascinates the mind. Sin says to us, I can make your life good. I can make your life pleasant. I can give you all kinds of advantages if you simply sin. But then sin also comes with God's judgment attached to it. Moses had to make that choice in Hebrews 11, verse 25, where we read of the choice he made. Shall I, he says to himself, shall I enjoy the pleasures of sin for a season? Those are the pleasures of of living in the sins of Egypt as the son of of Pharaoh's daughter, with all of the riches and all of the earthly glory that he could have in that position. But the pleasures of sin they were, and for a season. There was one option for Moses, and the other option for Moses was, or shall I choose to suffer affliction with the people of God? And then there's 1 John 2, 16. All that is in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life is not of the Father, but is of the world. Sin appeals to our lusts, our desires. Sin appeals to our eyes, to our senses. And sin then ensnares people. But imagine a world where we could sin as much as we liked without having to worry about God's judgment. That's what the sinner wants. That's what the sinner is working towards. Make sinful practices legal. Make sinful practices socially acceptable. Make sinful practices advantageous and profitable. Remove as much as possible the painful consequences of sin. And then you have, the world says, paradise on earth. A life without misery. Now, if such a world were possible... We could have a world where we could sin without consequences. The child of God would still say, by the grace of God, I am miserable because I'm a sinner. Sin itself makes me miserable because sin makes me, exposes me to the wrath of God. There is no such world, beloved, in which we can say there are no consequences for sin. There is no such world where God does not judge sin. There is no such world where God does not chastise his children when they sin. Sin is misery. We have to understand that because sin will try to contradict that testimony of God. Sin will try to attract us over and over again. We must have that in our mind. Sin is misery. 
Misery, first of all, because sin makes us guilty before God. And if you're guilty, that means that you are liable to punishment. We're guilty of breaking God's commandments. And because we're guilty before God, we're liable to punishment. God must, as we'll see in Lord's Day 4, God must punish guilty sinners. Sin makes us miserable also because it pollutes us or defiles us in the presence of God. It makes us obnoxious in the presence of God. God says about sin, I detest it. I loathe it. It is rebellion. It is corruption. It is vileness. It is filth. And we stand as sinners then, as those guilty of vile and abominable sins. That makes us miserable too. Sin makes us miserable also because sin is a kind of bondage or a kind of being under the power of some evil force. Sin comes upon us and within us and controls us. We find ourselves under the power of evil so that we cannot resist the power of sin. Sin controls our hearts and our affections and our minds and our wills so that we cannot deliver ourselves from the power of sin. And so sin makes us miserable. We're sinners. That's our misery. We're guilty before God. We're liable to punishment. We're polluted and defiled, obnoxious in God's sight, under the power of sin and death. Wretched servants of the devil. That's what we are as sinners. That's what we'll be forever as sinners, but for God's grace. There's the misery, and then the comfort comes. I belong to Jesus Christ. He has delivered me from sin. He has removed the guilt of sin. He has washed me from my sin. He has delivered me from the power of sin and of the devil. That's my comfort in the midst of my misery. I'm a sinner. That's my misery. And yet in the midst of that, I belong to Jesus Christ. That's my comfort. But the question was, how do you know Whence knowest thou? How do you know that you're miserable? Where does this knowledge come from? And the answer is, it comes from the law of God. If we did not have the law of God, we wouldn't know why we're miserable. We wouldn't understand what our sin is. We might say to ourselves, there's something not right. I can't put my finger on it. I don't know why but there's something not right. But the law tells us here is what is not right because here is the standard that God has given and you must live up to this standard. You fail to do that and therefore you are miserable. Think of the law this way then as a measuring rod, a measuring rod. And the catechism looks at the law in two different ways, in two different places in the catechism. The first way you could look at the law is by examining the law in detail. You could take each of the commandments, the Ten Commandments, and apply them in turn. That's the third part of the catechism on gratitude. Detailed instructions on how to show gratitude to God. 
that's not how the first part of the catechism approaches the law. It could have done that, though. Lord's Day 2 could have answered it this way. What doth the law of God require of, of us? And the catechism could have answered this way. The first commandment requires that we have no gods before Jehovah and forbids all idolatry. And then the second commandment requires that I make no images or likenesses of God and worship him only according to his word. And on and on it could have gone. And then the first part of the catechism on misery would have been much longer. We would have learned we are miserable idolaters. We are miserable Sabbath desecrators. We are miserable rebels against authority. We are miserable murderers and miserable adulterers and miserable thieves and miserable liars and miserable covetous people. That could have been the approach. But the Catechism takes a different approach. It looks at the law with respect to the summary of the law as that is recorded in Matthew 22 and in Mark 12. Christ teaches us that briefly. What does the law require of us? Christ teaches us that briefly by telling us what the heart of the law is, what the summary of the law is, what the essence of the law is, and that makes it even more searching. It's one thing to say, I am an idolater. I've broken the first commandment and the second commandment. I am an idolater. It's another thing to confess, I am an idolater because I hate God. Or I am an idolater because I do not love God. That shows me the motivation for my idolatry. It's one thing to say I dishonor authority, whether it be in the home or in the school or in the workplace or in society. I dishonor authority, the fifth commandment. But I can add to that, as I look at what the law has as its summary, I dishonor authority because I hate God, because I do not love God. And so my dishonoring authority is an expression of my hatred for God and my lack of love for God. Or I could say I speak lies. But worse than that is to say I speak lies because I hate God. I speak lies because I do not love God. That's worse. That's more searching. That tells me my motivation for speaking lies. That gives me the reason, the deep reason in my heart, in my soul, why I break these commandments. I hate God. I do not love him as I ought. That's my misery too. My misery is that I am prone by nature to hate God not to love him. And that's the approach that Jesus takes in Mark 12. Mark 12 is a parallel passage to Matthew 22. And in that chapter, Jesus is answering various questions posed to him by his enemies. These questions are designed to trick him. The context is the Passion Week the last week of his life on earth, he is preparing to go to the cross. He answers various questions that week. The question we look at this morning is, which is the first commandment of all? This was asked of Jesus by a scribe. A scribe was one of these Jews who was supposedly an expert 
on the Old Testament laws. A scribe. Which is, asks the scribe, which is the first commandment of all? That question might seem innocent. Perhaps it's just a a hypothetical question, a theological puzzle, perhaps. But this question is designed to trap Jesus. The parallel passage says that the scribe came tempting him. This was a theological question that the rabbis liked to ask. There were, the rabbis said, 613 laws in the Old Testament. They had decided, they had extracted these from the Old Testament. There are 613 laws. And there were various debates then among these scholars, which one of these 613 laws is the greatest? Which side is Jesus going to take? Now, if he chooses the wrong one, he'll be accused of minimizing the others. Let's say he says, the sixth, thou shalt not kill. The sixth commandment is the greatest. You're minimizing adultery then. Or you're emphasizing the life of man above the glory of God. You should have said the first commandment, not the sixth commandment. Or he says the law of the burnt offering is the greatest of all the commandments. Well, then you're minimizing circumcision and the covenant. So these are questions where there's no answer that's going to please your audience. It's a no-win, lose-lose situation. Whatever you say, you're going to be accused of something. Learn to recognize those kind of questions and avoid answering them. Jesus answers this question with perfect wisdom in Mark 12, 29, and 30. The first of all the commandments is, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one Lord, and thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, and with all thy soul, and with all thy mind, and with all thy strength. This is the first commandment, and the second is like unto it, Namely this, thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. There is none other commandment greater than these. Jesus does not choose one of the Ten Commandments, the first or the third or the sixth or the tenth, nor does he identify one of the ceremonial laws as the greatest of all the commandments. He highlights, rather, the summary of the law. Here it is. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one Lord. He identifies, then, who this God is. He is the Lord thy God. That's his covenant name. A name which shows him to be the eternal and unchangeable and perfectly faithful God who keeps his promises. He is Lord. That a name means he has authority and he has power. He is the redeemer of God's people. He is one, one Lord. Not two or three, but one Lord. There is no other God beside him. And here is our calling. Here is our calling. Not, thou shalt obey the Lord thy God, or thou shalt fear the Lord thy God, or thou shalt worship the Lord thy God, or thou shalt serve the Lord thy God. All those things are true, of course, but thou shalt love him. Love him. Obedience and fear and worship and service are good and necessary for the child of God, but they are the activity of servants. 
love. Love is the activity of sons and of daughters. And, sh- and so we learn from this that our obedience and fear and worship and service of God must be done out of love. Love for God, first of all. And that means a number of things. Love for God means, first, that we have deep affection for God as the object of our delight. We delight in Him. We love Him. And these scribes had forgotten that. They love to get together and argue about minute details of the law, which of the laws is the greatest, and so on and so forth. But they had lost their love for the God who gave that law. They did not delight in that God as precious and dear to them. And we can do that too. We can come to church and we can sit in the pew and we can say, I'm worshiping God. I'm serving him. I'm keeping the fourth commandment. But the question we have to ask ourselves is this, are we doing that out of love for God? Are we delighting in God as we are worshiping him? Think of Psalm 73, verse 26. Whom have I in heaven but thee? And there is none upon earth that I desire beside thee. My flesh and heart faileth, but God is the strength of my heart and my portion for ever. That must be the motivation for our keeping God's commandments. A deep delight in God, a deep and ardent love for God. Love means, second, we seek what is best for the object of our love. If I might speak that way, beloved, what is best for God? What is best for God? Now, of course, God does not need anything from us. We don't add anything to him. But what is best for him is his glory. We love God by seeking his glory, by seeking above all things to bring glory unto his name, And the Pharisees and scribes had forgotten that too. As they argued about all of these details, they were more interested in their own glory and their own reputation. How do people see me? They asked themselves. I want people to have a good opinion of me as the religious elite of Israel, as the pious ones, but they had lost sight of the glory of God. We must not lose sight of that, beloved, as we actively seek to keep God's commandments, as we avoid certain behaviors and attitudes, we have to ask ourselves the question, why am I doing this? And the answer must be, I am seeking the glory of God. And love for God means, third, we draw near to the object of our love. Love is the expression of a personal relationship with another in this situation with God himself. And it's possible, as the Pharisees and scribes did, it's possible outwardly to keep God's commandments, but without giving to God our heart. We're not drawing near to the object of our love 
then. And so our keeping of God's commandments must be an expression of our fellowship with God. We're God's people. We have a relationship with this God. And here is how we express our relationship with this God, by keeping his commandments. Not, you'll notice, in order to enter into his fellowship, not to stay in God's fellowship, not to gain the experience of God's fellowship, but as an expression of the life that we have with God as we walk with him. Here's Jesus in John 14, 23. If a man love me, here's how you'll know. If a man love me, he will keep my words. My words, my commandments, and my Father will love him. And we, my Father and I, we will come unto him and make our abode with him. And then the contrary, he that loveth me not keepeth not my sayings. And the Pharisees and scribes had forgotten this also. For them, law-keeping was a matter not of the heart, but of external duties. They obeyed God because they hoped to merit something with God, because they wanted to have something from God, not because they loved God, but because they wanted God to give them something. Here's what Synod 2018 said. Obedience is the life of the covenant. Obedience is the life of the covenant. As God's justified and sanctified friends' servants delight in walking in obedient friendship with their friend sovereign to whom they are beholden for all the good works they do and not he to them. Watch your life. Your life is a life of living in fellowship with God. And what does that look like? Obedience. Walking in obedience, walking in the light, and not walking in the darkness. But Jesus then drives this point home even more deeply into the scribe's heart and consciousness and conscience by confronting him with the strictness of this command. You ask me, which is the greatest of the commandments? Well, here it is. And let me show you how strict that is. The law, says, says Jesus here, the law has a claim upon every aspect of your being. Your heart, your soul, your mind, your strength. Every aspect of your being then must be devoted to God. And every aspect of your being must be devoted entirely to God, holy. With all thy heart, with all thy soul, with all thy mind, and with all thy strength. You say to yourself, I can't do that. And you're right. And I can't do that either. No one among us can do that. To love God with all your heart, all your soul, all your mind, all your strength, 
Was that true of you last week? We're beginning a new week, first day of the week. Look back over the last week. Was that true of you? Loving God with all of your heart and all the time with no interruptions and not loving yourself more than God ever? Of course not. But God, of course, is not satisfied with half-hearted devotion. God will not receive simply the leftovers after you've served yourself with most of your heart and with most of your soul and with most of your mind, with most of your strength. Maybe you say to me, but pastor, that's unreasonable. How can God require that of me? Is it really, though? Is it really unreasonable? Who is this God? God is love. He expects us to love Him with the entirety of the intensity of our devotion. Does His love toward us, shown to us in the cross of Jesus Christ, does that love deserve from us a half hearted response? Of course not. And this is the God, remember, who is the God of infinite beauty, the adorable God, the God of spotless holiness, perfect wisdom, unfailing love, unfailing goodness. Is he not worthy of all of our heart and soul and mind and strength? And ask yourself, would you dare say, no, he's not? Would you dare say, well, there's someone else who is worthier of the love of my whole heart and soul and mind and strength? Who is that? Is it you? Is it your neighbor? Is it your wife? Your children? Your parents? Your siblings? Your fellow believers? God. God is worthy. Only God is worthy of the love of our whole heart, our whole soul, our whole mind, our whole strength, all of it. And then he adds, Thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. Our neighbor is anyone who crosses our pathway in life. And God says about that neighbor, whoever he might be or whoever she might be, I put this person on your pathway so that you might love him or love her. Show affection towards him or her. Delight in him or her as precious and dear. Seek that person's highest good and draw that person near into your fellowship. That's what love is. And then God says, here is practically speaking how you're going to do that. The Ten Commandments tell you how you're going to do that, how you're going to love your neighbor by honoring his position, whether he is above you or below you, and love your neighbor by avoiding anything that might hurt his body or soul, and love your neighbor by promoting and guarding his purity and respecting his property and promoting and his good name and reputation, and love him according to this standard as yourself, as yourself. As much as you delight in yourself, delight in your neighbor. As much as you desire good for yourself, seek the good of your neighbor. That's the standard that God gives to us. The measuring rod against which we're called to measure ourselves. Am I doing this? Have I done this? And the scribe was impressed by Jesus' answer. 
but he was not changed by it. He was impressed by it, but not changed by it. Notice his reaction to Jesus in verse 32. Well, Master, thou hast said the truth. For there is one God, and there is none other but he, and to love him with all the heart, and with all the understanding, and with all the soul, and with all the strength, and to love his neighbor as himself is more than all whole burnt offerings and sacrifices. He's impressed. What a good answer that is, Jesus. I'm really impressed by that answer. But does he go home and compare himself with that standard? Does he apply to himself what he has just learned? Jesus warns him, thou art not far from the kingdom of God. Not far, but not in the kingdom of God either. And to be not far, but not in the kingdom of God is a very perilous thing. If this scribe had learned anything from his encounter with Jesus, he ought to have compared himself with the standard that Jesus set. And he ought to have had this reaction, O wretched man that I am! God commands me to love him, and I fall far short. And God commands me to love my neighbor, and I do not do this. Who shall deliver me from my sins? And then he ought to have sought salvation in Jesus Christ. But very likely, he went back to his home and to his fellow scribes and remained self-righteous, and proud. Because he looked at the law theoretically. We ought not do that. We ought not say about the law, well, it's nice in theory and so on, but the law is designed to be a measuring rod. We're supposed to compare ourselves with that standard and come to this conclusion, I do not measure up. And that's why I am miserable. I do not measure up. And that's the conclusion that the Catechism has us confess. Canst thou keep all these things perfectly? No. By no means. And the answer given here is very clear, but also very shocking. The answer is not, well, I'm not perfect. The world will say that. I am not perfect. The answer is not, well, I think I do a pretty good job. I'm a decent person, all things considered. That's not the answer either. If that's your answer, beloved, after hearing this word of God and the strict standard of God's law, you're not really troubled by your sins. You don't really understand what sin is. The answer is this, in no wise, for I am prone by nature to hate God and my neighbor. Here is what God requires of me. Love, love, love and I am prone by nature to hate, to detest and to loathe him from the deepest of my being. Nature. My misery then is very deep. My misery penetrates my very nature. It's not... I do a few hateful things or I speak a few hateful words. But hatred is deeply embedded in me. It is part of who I am. It is my default position, you might say, to hate God and my neighbor. 
And there's nothing more horrible than that. We're prone by nature to hate God, the God who made us, the God who redeemed us, the God who loves us, the God who is a father to us. We're prone to hate him and we're prone to to hate our neighbor, the one that God commands us to love. That ought to be your reaction, beloved, this morning to this truth. That upholds me. I am horrified by that. And if that's your reaction, I have good news. That means, that means that God's grace has been working in you. Because that means that you do love God from the heart, albeit imperfectly. You do love God from the heart, and you are sorry from the heart that you hate him by your nature. And you say to yourself as a child of God, if I could, if I could, I would reach into my chest and pluck out that hateful nature which hates God. I want to be rid of it. Why? Because the Holy Spirit has worked in my heart. The Holy Spirit dwells in me. The Holy Spirit causes me to hate my sin. And how comes it that I have the Holy Spirit in me and others do not have the Holy Spirit in them and therefore don't have this reaction to this truth that I have? It's because Jesus died for me to purchase for me that Holy Spirit. And that means that even though I am by nature prone to hate God and my neighbor, I still belong to Jesus Christ. He's my comfort, and he will never let me go because he has paid for all of my sins on the cross and risen again for my salvation, and I belong to him. Amen. Our Father in heaven, We are humbled before thee because we are prone by nature to hate thee and the neighbor, and yet we are horrified by that truth. We desire that it would not be true of us. We desire to love thee because thou hast first loved us. Forgive us, O Father, for that wicked nature which is within us, and teach us to walk in obedience to thy commandments out of love for thee, our God, who loved us and gave thy son Jesus to be our Savior, to whom we belong, body and soul, in life and in death. All this we pray for Christ's sake. Amen. We sing from Psalter 202, again an expression of our love for God. Let's sing the three stanzas of 202.
The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit abide with you all. Amen.